This is one of the more anticlimactic introductions I've ever heard you make. And we've already had a discussion, and we're done. <laughs> he said, thank you, you guys left us, it's really great. I feel very retro today with my Innsbruck uh, shirt, like I'm going to go play golf or something after the meeting here. <laughs> um, well, welcome, welcome to the November meeting of the Internet Developer Group. We'll be recording it again, and uh, if I ever get out of... Uh, some sort of operating system hell, I'll actually be able to get a real audio file up so people who prefer that way can actually get one. Until then, I'll, I'll put it up under the media file. Uh, our speaker tonight is going to talk about something that, uh, that not too many people know about. It's one of those little things in the inside of the, of the net that uh, they don't think about. I know I had someone who was connected through one of my servers, uh, one of my routers, firewall routers, IT masquerades. And he kept saying, it's slowing down, it's slowing down, it's slowing down. I said, no, I think maybe you're getting too much PDP and you're getting control of what's coming down there. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. I, can't do that. I think it was, because I was seeing mail just fine. <laughs> you know, I see the other things just fine. But something was going on there. And by the way, we'll, we'll bring this up in question later, but uh, the ISP denied it was happening. But I know that I was getting stuff and he wasn't, so I suspect something on that. All right. <laughs> Our speaker this evening is Yuval uh, Shahar. Shahar, yeah. And uh, his early experience with National Semiconductor and Motorola led him into starting some interesting things, which we've had talks on and we're maybe ready for another one too, by the way, because he was one of the uh, early guys and VP of R&D at Vocal Tech in Voice over IP products, which is a coming technology. Uh, he went on from there to, uh, to co-found or found InfoGear to make web appliances. And about two years ago, we had a whole series of presentations on tablets and PDAs and other kinds of web appliances. He was a co-founder of Pentacon in, uh, in 1999. And from there, went on to found PCube. And PCube's main job is to manage the IP traffic at the upper layers, not down at the physical layer like many people might do, but actually from anywhere from layer three to layer seven. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, just exactly how we can get our hands around the, the hot new applications of today, according to my son, who's in the middle of this demographic. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I have a feeling this is going to be very interactive. <laughs> um, so what I've done is this. Um, I've copied the code, but uh, we'll talk about who's part of network resellers and what the network is like and why it's changing and how. Um, we're bit about half of this. And then I'll try to address some of the more uh, technical issues of how we deal with it, um, what is um, within the technology that will help drive um, some of what the network needs in order to grow up. And uh, jump in any time. So the first few slides are, are a little bit of uh, more conceptual slides, but essentially just uh, to, to provide the mindset of where we're coming from. Um, and essentially, we started with, uh, as I said earlier, a little bit before this became fashionable, but we looked at the network and we called it just basically transport. Um, there was a lot of fiber getting deployed. Um, well, people saying at some point during the bubble that there are areas around the globe where a meteor hit the earth, it would bounce right back into space because there's so much fiber under the ground. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we knew there's going to be a lot of connectivity, and we said that's fine. Um, connectivity is like an IP dial tone. So you have the dial tone, what do you do with it? And um, we often said uh, a great broadband connection to the home is like having a a great set of the art PC with just windows on it. Um, you can still have fun for a while, um, but the real value of having a PC is there's a lot of interesting applications you can buy and install that actually do something useful for you. And we looked at the network and we said, if that doesn't evolve, um, just providing uh, commodity transport is not going to be a profitable business. And um, again, four years ago, profitable was not part of business. <laughs> so, um, the, the, the basic business model was um, if you lose on every customer but make up for it in volume, you can have a great IPO and, and uh, be very successful. And so um, we started this anyway. We looked at uh, how 
the connectivity will continue to evolve and came up with the concept saying, we're not out there to create a better network transport device. We are assuming there are great companies building transport um, elements, routers, switches, aggregation boxes. Um, and so our target was to build this intelligent overlay that would sit in the IT network and not worry about where packets need to go, but instead would worry about what applications run on the network, what users um, are up to, and try to use those tools to provide visibility and create some model for differentiation. Um, essentially what this is saying is today's, today's uh, network um, flat fee is, is like an all you can eat buffet. And, and that is okay, um, and we'll talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, and peer-to-peer -to, -peer to some extent is like um, say the local football team um, figuring out the local all you can eat and waiting it three times a day. Um, <laughs> at some point, that, that stops being a, a, a viable business, and so you have to do something about it. You have to either um, limit the football team or say you can eat anything on the salads, but uh, for me, that's a separate queue and you pay extra. Um, the same is happening with the network. So transport is commodity, it's a flat fee, but now people are using it, um, abusing it, and pushing the carriers to deploy more capacity with no return, because it provides more capacity not to enable signing up new users. It's the same users that will just use more and more of it. So, um, so essentially, we're, we said, here's where this needs to go. So there's got to be some differentiation. There's got to be some ability to deliver services over this IP broadband connection that people are actually willing to pay for. And, and again, in the early days, we were asked, um, broadband is expensive. Would people pay even more to get services? And we said, it's like saying, a computer is really expensive. So that would people actually buy software? Um, yeah, without it, yeah, it's not useful. Um, and um, so with that, we looked at where is the network and where we think it should go. And so the first um, is what can the network provide? And we look at today's or, or the basic transport network. And it's essentially connectivity. So yeah, they talk about services, um, VPN as a service. Um, MPLS, people talk about it as a service. Um, content delivery networks was a big thing um, just uh, two years ago. And, and all those are great. We consider them to be part of transport. They're better ways, secure ways to create connectivity. When we talk about services, we mean gaming, we mean voice, we mean video, we mean all the stuff that would drive those VPN tunnels or MPLS tunnels and actually um, do something useful. Um, in terms of how the network is built, philosophically, you look at transport and it's a fixed function, packet-oriented world. So um, to, to um, summarize transport and maybe two sentences, the basic function of any transport device is a packet comes in, you look at the header, headers have a fairly fixed offset. So you look at the offset that you care about, you do a table lookup, tells you what to do with the packet. You change the packet, send it on its way and get ready for the next packet. That's how you route, that's how you switch, that's how you do most of the, the basic functions that a transport network needs. Um, we looked at services, um, and it's not about um, a fixed function anymore, it's not about single packets anymore. So if you want to look at um, an application session that is carried by packets. Um, first, you have to look into the payload. And the payload doesn't have this well-structured uh, set of offsets. Um, so you've got to have some programmability in order to be able to describe what those payloads carry. Uh, then uh, it's going to be some kind of a, a transaction-based architecture because typically the payload doesn't hold, a single payload doesn't necessarily hold enough information. So now you have to put consecutive payloads together to look at a message. You need to track message exchanges. Yep. Are you looking at UDP payloads and TCP payloads? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you have to store them. We've done um, yeah, we, we don't have to store them, but we have to store state. What well, information? Yeah, right, don't information. Right, right, right. And that's what I meant. Yeah. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that's it. That's what I meant. Okay. There's some level of depth. Anyway. But philosophically, we care about sessions. When a packet comes in, um, uh, the equivalent um, description to the transport packet-oriented function. 
for us, a packet comes in, the first thing we do is match this packet to one of hundreds of thousands of millions of states of ongoing sessions. And if there isn't a match, then this is a new session. Um, and we bring in this context. We say, what is the session up to? Oh, it's a voice IP channel. Has it opened the video um, um, channel? Uh, what is it trying to do? At which state is it? And at some point, you know what to do with the session. And then you can treat the session it's in its entirety, one way or another. Uh, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit more. But it's, it's a different architecture. It's uh, a lot of state and memory management. Um, and um, and very programmable. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to keep up with um, applications that um, get introduced almost daily. Um, and then the last is the business model. And uh, part of the, the deal here is to try and move from just a flat, basic um, entrance fee, and everything else is all you can eat, to probably, at least on wireline, uh, still a flat fee, but then some differentiation. And I'll give some examples. Um, SLAs, um, again, often the SLA, SLA is a service level agreement, but service here is actually transport. You measure latency, you measure uptime. You don't measure how good your voice connection was or how much actual content were you able to, to get. Um, so that's going to be, become more granular um, and more accurate if you want to create a richer business model. Question? Yep. You talked about the service elements being non-programmable. Obviously, a lot of these network devices it's kind of software. In fact, there's hardly any hardware left. Everything right down to the chip level is programmable. So, to what to what extent, or can you specify what you mean by non-programmability? Um, the core of a router, for example, or a switch, um, deals with um, a fairly small number of protocols. So it could be routing protocols, could be BGP, could be a, whatever it is. Those protocols are well defined. They're controlled by standards groups or the ITF. Um, you don't have to turn on support for a new routing feature overnight or over the weekend. Um, in the, the application aware world, um, a new version of peer to peer protocols, gaming protocols, uh, instant messaging protocols um, spontaneously get deployed and become popular literally overnight. So there is no programming environment around the router where you could um, change the uh, core or the insides of the router to be able to do more things. Yeah, this iOS for Cisco, and yeah, the next drop of iOS is nine months down the road, and it will bring in new features. Um, but nine months in our world is eternity. In a packet world, it's not. It's those packet headers don't You're change. You're not talking about end user provisioning of that. The service provider using these network services <coughs> still has to do a plan upgrade? Um, so the, the provisioning is, is, uh, is a complementary story to this. And again, I'll touch provisioning a little bit. In fact, those slides talk about it a little bit. But um, you always have a set of configurable options. And then the provisioning environment can decide whether or not to turn them on or off. Um, but provisioning environment cannot um, create new capabilities in the router. And um, there is no um, programming environment that the ISP can use to create new capabilities in the router. The router is what it is. It's got a lot of software in it. And you can use or not use some of the options that it provides. But that's as far as it goes. Uh, do you do any provisioning templates ahead of time? And you enable them as needed? Is that what you do? or? Um, so. Okay. Well, you're actually, your SLAs are actually based on contracts signed by people instead of just contracts signed. Um, they could be. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. But, but um, this is um, so. This is another angle of, of the difficulty of all of this. If you look at. Um,